Thank you and good morning, or as Bob says, whatever it is. <laughs> These are wonderful long days. I want to talk about uh, basically the, what amounts to hard-edged, um, scientific, statistically based uh, material, but I would like to uh, start by mentioning that this project uh, began because we were interested in consciousness. We were interested in the possibility that there is interconnection among people, that there might even be something that could be construed as a global consciousness. I won't prove or demonstrate that necessarily, but we have some very interesting results over time. Uh, I guess most importantly, I think we're able to show with clarity that there really is, as Gertrude Stein said, some there there. Uh, the odds are uh, of uh, this being just chance is a uh, million to one or 10 million to one. Um, we have independent measures and they're correlated, they have correlated response uh, to these events. There's some structure in terms of distance, in terms of time, and uh, also in terms of uh, what you might think of as psychological qualities. There's a lot of structure where there shouldn't be any. This is what the uh, network looks like and has spread out over the world. You'll see a lot of concentration in the US and Europe, but we have tried to get a distribution that was big enough so we could ask questions about distance. The data flow through the internet to Princeton, and that's what the data look like when they're coming in. So we have to do a lot of processing uh, to make sense or make, uh, find out whether there in, indeed is any, any kind of structure in the data. The, um, we look at each um, of the devices, which we often call eggs. They're, that's a node in the network. It's a random event generator with custom software. And if we look at them separately and then calculate an average of, of their accumulating deviation over time, it will look something like this a black uh, summary trace, and it may look like this. In our formal experiments, we first define the event. We figure out, uh, we decide that there's an interesting event, something that might possibly affect uh, global consciousness, if you will, by, because it makes an awful lot of people feel the same emotions, uh, think the same kind of thoughts. So we uh, discover the event, in the news, perhaps. And then uh, we uh, define the beginning and end and extract the data and do the calculations. So the experiment is done uh, in a, a hypothesis testing sense. We know um, ahead of time without looking at the data which data we're interested in. And uh, we often show, use these kind of figures to plot the result. They're really just a historical um, record of the duration of the event, but this uh, point at the end is the point we're interested in, in terms of a bottom line statistic for each of the events. Here, I'll just give you two or three examples and then get on to the you know, kind of analytic details. This is September 11th in the context of uh, a week of surrounding days. So we, if we look at, at the, our first prediction, really only encompassed four hours. That's the formal prediction, and it was marginally significant. It was at the 0.02 level or something like that. Had we realized the magnitude in, in consciousness space, we might have said, let's look at two days. That um, effect in the data, data should look like what it looks like on the left, a, a kind of random walk with a level trend. And, and of course, you see uh, when we examine over a longer period of time, uh, there's a tremendous uh, uh, persistence in the effect, a big deviation that's apparently associated with the feelings and thoughts that people had. This one is a completely different kind of event. This one uh, was a planned and organized, synchronized meditation, which we, as best we can tell, involved about a half a million people around the world. Uh, that's not a huge number in comparison to what 9-11 might produce. Nevertheless, there's a powerful deviation from the expected level trend. Here, another completely different kind of event, New Year's. We've now had 10 New Year's that we could look at. 
And the question, one of the questions we ask is, does the variability of the data uh, stay constant or does it de decrease? And as you can see, a few minutes before midnight, when people are beginning to think uh, midnight's coming, I'm, I have to find my partner so I can get a hug or I have to get my glass ready so I can toast the new year and so forth. Uh, fairly uh, strong uh, evidence that there's even in an unimportant event, uh, this uh, coalescence of large numbers of people in a s similar direction or the same uh, interest can produce um, an effect on our random event generator network. This is a picture of the data over uh, almost 10 years. Uh, there are 250 events, and the cumulative even though sometimes it's backwards, sometimes we're flat, sometimes there's no kind of effect, um, the tendency is for there to be an effect. It's relatively small, but the accumulation over such a large number of formal trials is highly significant with a z-score equivalent to five uh, plus standard deviations, um, million to one odds or smaller. The independent statistics um, are, we have names for them. We call one of them network variance or NETVAR, NETVAR and a second one which um, is called COVAR. They're really pair products in the one case of z-scores and the other case of squared z-scores. One is more responsive to distance um, implications and one more responsive to uh, temporal um, interconnections in the data. If we plot those um, over time the, we see, and compare that with the kind of control data, the gray cloud is a thousand resamplings uh, from the database with the same kind, the same event definitions, except now they're just randomly, uh, pieces of data randomly extracted. Uh, that's a kind of background um, that we would, you expect from truly random data. All three, all, both of those measures or a combination of those independent measures show a pretty strong uh, difference. Here's another way to look at the independent uh, measure question. We created a random sample of pseudo events with a, an effect size equivalent to what we find in the database. And that blue curve shows what happens, not unexpectedly, because we've constructed a, a powerful uh, large database of uh, small effect sizes. We get a, a peak z-score of seven or eight uh, standard deviations. Now the, the question is what happens if we, on these pseudo events, calculate the same uh, kind of, uh, the same, uh, do the same calculations, but now with our covariance measure. And the red trace shows that there's basically no, nothing there. This is, a, I think, a good demonstration of the true independence of these measures. Now going on to some of the other, the structure we uh, see that if we move the event from its real time, slide it toward the future or toward the past, uh, we quickly uh, lose the, the high, high de uh, departure from expectation and, and, and uh, enter in a kind of random space. This also answers the question that some people ask, aren't there a lot of other spikes in the database? And this, in a sense, shows that the spikes associated with the events that are predefined are themselves spectacular. The correlation between the two measures is shown in the right-hand figure. Uh, they both are centered on the time of the real event, and if you move uh, the event artificially from either to the future or the past, uh, it changes. Another version of time structure. Um, this, by the way, I should, uh, I, I believe it was on the first slide, but much of this work is, the, is uh, from Peter Bensell, who was here uh, at the SSC meeting and gave a pre presentation last year. He, um, um, in this case, looked at the correlation between our two independent measures. They both respond to the, uh, to the um, events, but uh, that response has a time course. It, it appears, I mean, if you read this graph and interpret it, what it means is that the real interesting time period is about one or two hours. That means something like the um, moment for a global consciousness is an hour or two long. Uh, 
in, in, in some sense. There's interesting questions about what's happening at the beginning. We think this may mean um, that we're in this uh, jog at the beginning of the graph may mean that the correlation, the co covariance measure lags the um, net network variance measure. But we've got a lot more work to do. This is a complicated slide. We do a weighted regression, which you can see in the green straight line in both graphs. It's uh, significant. And what this is, means is that the uh, measures, which are driven by this uh, a correlation between our pairs, pairs of REGs, is stronger when the pairs are close to each other than it is when they're far apart. So we actually have a distance um, uh, uh, indication. This is just a picture of that. The, uh, on the left here, we have a short, relatively short distance compared with a long distance. Another way to look at the same data, the blue curves uh, show the data in each of those two measures for pair separations less than 8,000 kilometers and the red data for uh, pair separations greater than 8,000 kilometers. Very interesting and to me surprising because my intuition going in was that we had a truly non-local phenomenon. So we can easily or relatively easily categorize a lot of the events into things like terror, or political events, natural disasters, and so on. Uh, we collapse this to a smaller set, which is, makes it easier to read. What's shown here is uh, a, a group um, terror events and partisan events where the stimulus to have the same, same emotions comes from the outside, in a sense, uh, compared with something where the meditation, where the, uh, the stimulus is basically kind of internal. And what we see is that the network variance blue column is much stronger than the um, the, than the re response from the, in the covariance, covariance measure uh, for the, these uh, terror and partisan events. We have a lot more work to do to really understand this, but it, it looks like, um, well, li literally, that the two different kinds of independent measures are actually responsive to different kinds of things. This is just an analysis of variance showing the same data uh, that there is an interaction between the type of statistic we use and the category that they're in. By, in several different groupings, we see this, that it's, there's a significant outcome. So if there is consciousness driving what our system does, one might ask, what happens if people are awake versus asleep? We might imagine there's a little more tendency while people are awake. What this shows is in the center, um, the, a real 24-hour day compared with days that are, that are minutes longer or minutes shorter there's a pretty uh, impressive spike. It's actually only 16 to 1 odds, but it's, um, it suggests that there really is a kind of consciousness pressure on the data when people are awake. The, long, there's, the blue curve show a long-term long trend in our data, which is in a way kind of mysterious. Why would this happen? Um, we look for some sort of external correlate, and Peter decided to gather all kinds of um, presidential, uh, all kinds of polling data, and looked in particular at the presidential approval ratings, which, as you can see in the left-hand graph, even in the raw form, have a fairly similar kind of uh, trend. When we do a simple model to fit the presidential approval data to the, um, to the global consciousness and network variance, it's a very striking fit. No proof of uh, a, a causal result. Okay, this is my last uh, slide. There, there is um, in, in, in the last uh, 10 years or nine years, some 600 earthquakes in the world or 700 uh, with Richter magnitude 7 or greater. In other words, damaging quakes. About um, 100 of those have been on land where they matter to people and the rest are in the ocean. So this graph shows a strong pattern when they're on the land and not much uh, of a pattern at all when these quakes occur in the ocean. What's perhaps uh, more interesting in a certain sense, and again, a temporal structural kind of thing, uh, this central portion is magnified here and actually separated into two independent subsets, both of which show the same pattern. And that pattern 
uh, begins about eight hours before uh, the m uh, minimum point, uh, which is at the time of the quake. So, okay, uh, last point. Um, was, oh, I, this is the button. <laughs> The fact that only where the, the only the quakes which affect people uh, show any pattern suggests, I think, strongly that consciousness definitely is involved. Lots of other things do. There's even a suggestion of premonition, but more work to do to to discover where there's any reality to that. Thank you very much. This is the uh, part of the group who help. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. I just wanted to ask, because I have a son who lives in Los Angeles, could you please call me if, that, if you <laughs> see that happening? One of the uh, uh, suggestions that uh, the data give is that we could, in principle, predict things. The trouble is that if we see a, a strange uh, change in the data, um, we don't know much more than that the data are responding to something. We don't know where, whether it's Los Angeles or maybe China. And uh, we don't know when exactly it will be either. But it's a good thought. Roger, wonderful update and beautiful data. Um, question about this, this possible distance effect. Um, if you, for example, look at the earthquake data, you know, earthquakes are, are very physically localized. And you literally, because you've got a span all around the world, right. you, have, you have eggs or REGs that are quite some distance from a given quake. If you plot the data, as a function of distance from a quake, averaging over all the quakes, for particularly obviously the ones that are on land, is there a distance effect? There is a small distance effect, but the one that we know most about has to do with the distance between pairs of REGs. Our pair, the average pair correlation is greater for uh, the REGs that are close to each other. We do have also already a suggestion, some uh, of an answer to your question, and it is positive. There is a drop-off of effect uh, with, regard, with regard to what appears to be the focal point of the event. Yes. There's one. Is it possible to have a dedicated reg for a specific area? And somehow in the intentionality says, however you level or think of intentionality, you reg will only ever respond to anything from that specific spot or event style, or like an earthquake, and nothing else from the intentions you want to put on this. Do you think that's conceptually possible? It, uh, given the nature of the meeting and the, uh, the content of the talks we've been listening to, I'm inclined to say anything is possible. But uh, more seriously, I, I think the, in the nature of the question that we ask is very important. And basically, that's what you're talking about. If we specify the task, so to speak, or if we task an REG, it's, um, it's, there is some evidence that the REG will uh, be responsive to that tasking. You could, but uh, it wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to use the same uh, you know, material as we have here because we're talking about pairwise correlations. It really is a global uh, response. We don't know how deep that correlation structure goes, but at least the major stuff is driven by inter-REG correlations. And have you done any um, analysis of, as opposed to distance, cultural connection? Like if, if a culture feels more connected to where an event happens, is their response bigger? I think I can answer in the affirmative. We haven't done very much of that, but once in a while there'll be something, well, for example, we look at political events, which, and more often than not, they're US-based uh, political events. And um, we look, this is usually exploratory, not formal. The formal is always asking about the whole network. But if we look at the local REGs uh, for, to that, uh, let's say the US, if we s limit the subset, we see uh, typically a little bit larger response uh, to it than we do for the whole network. Is that answering your question? Yeah, yeah we, we don't have that much sophistication yet. We're working on it. 
Roger, a comment uh, about your, resp uh, I think, appropriate response to the question over here about could you specify behavior on the rigs. Uh, I appreciate your saying, well, we're in this group, we know anything is possible. Uh, but more specifically, the question you ask is so significant. Um, it makes me think of Bill Tiller's work with intentionally imprinted electronic devices, where he works with specific, very, very specific processes and questions. So I would say the Tiller work combined with this work says the answer is yes. Yes, I think it is definitely yes, but it's something that we have only begun to explore. I mean, we've formulated the question, and it's a, it uh, needs a little more refinement, and then it'll be a good question, which will have the answer Im embedded in it. Bill? Roger, do you have any uh, results in the Chine uh, Chinese earthquakes? Did you have a, because of the location? Yes, the Chinese earthquake is a uh, positive deviation. It's not itself highly significant. We have learned over time, slowly, that major disasters, um, the effects on human consciousness and the emotional state of the world develop over days, not in the few hours that typically are our events. So um, the answer is yes, there's uh, definitely an effect registered. Yeah. Thank you, Roger.